I come to Universal Orlando every single week, and these are my favorite things at Islands of Adventure. Hey, ma'am fam, we are back with another episode of Molly's Favorite Things. It's like Oprah's Favorite Things, except nobody gets a car, and if you check under your seat, I don't know what you'll find. If you're at my house, it'd be like a dog toy, maybe a sock, quarter. Let me know what's under your seat, I guess. Anyway, this is the show where I take you with me to the theme parks and I spill my favorite thing in every single land. I'm lucky enough to go to theme parks and travel for a living, so I've developed quite a few opinions. Some of my favorites are the big e-ticket must-do attractions, but some of my favorites are lesser known snacks and places to hide from the crowds. We're gonna have a lot of fun at Universal today. Got some tricky decisions to make, so let's get in there. Now, the way Molly's favorite things works, it's not just a simple list of my top favorite things in the parks because that would be too simple and I'm too competitive. I like to make everything a game. So the way this game works is that I have to pick a favorite thing in every single land. It's definitely going to be a challenge because in some lands like Jurassic Park and the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, it's going to be hard to narrow it down to just one favorite. And in other lands, looking at you, Toon Lagoon, it's going to be hard to pick a favorite at all. But I've gotten out my map and my trusty pen. I've done the thinking. I've molded over. I've made some bold choices. Either way, I'm going to share some fun tips and tricks for Universal along the way. I'll highlight some of the must-dos outside of my top picks as well. And let's get in there. Islands of Adventure is Universal's second theme park. It opened up in 1999. And it is themed to, brace yourself, different islands of adventure. <gasps> That's why each of the lands have somewhat of an islandy style name, save Wizarding World of Harry Potter, which was a later addition to the park. Each of the eight lands is supposed to be a different island, a different continent, a different place for adventure. And we've already made it to our first one, the Port of Entry. As the name would suggest, Port of Entry is your entrance into Islands of Adventure. It's kind of a generically themed exotic marketplace style. There's definitely some Asian and Middle Eastern influences. It's not related to any IP, intellectual property. However, it is incredibly well themed. If you look around and read the signs and look at all the detail, it is incredibly themed. However, the issue I'm going to have with most of these Molly's Favorite Thing videos is that there's not a lot in the entranceways of the parks. There's not any rides or major attractions at the entrances of most parks. It's mostly just shopping, dining, and various guest services. Here in Port of Entry, you'll see things like the Port of Entry Christmas Shop, which I do like and is a contender for this choice. You've got the candy shop here. The big store of the theme park is Islands of Adventure Trading Co., which is where you're going to find most of the merch from around the park. As far as dining goes, you've got Starbucks here, also a contender by default, but also because coffee. Cinnabon a contender because Cinnabons. Is the Lucky Monkey my favorite thing in this land? He's pretty cute. And it sounds like they're having a darn good time in that casino. Anyway, I don't think the Lucky Monkey quite captures my favorite thing pick. But you're also gonna have more sit-down restaurants in addition to the Starbucks and the Cinnamon. You've got Confisco Grill, which is a table service restaurant, as well as the Backwater Bar, which is a full service bar that also serves some bites. Ultimately though, in a land that otherwise wouldn't get a favorite shout out if I wasn't playing this game I made up for myself, I'm gonna go with the Croissant Moon Bakery. And you know what? I'm glad I had to pick something here because I'm also going to share a very important tip for my fellow coffee fans. The Croissant Moon Bakery is quite literally directly across the street from Starbucks, but I do think it's the superior coffee shop. But the reason that it trumps Starbucks, well, it's twofold. One, as much as I enjoy Starbucks coffee, I think it's more fun to get something unique to the theme park or something you can't get literally at a layover in Milwaukee. And two, they have mobile order. Starbucks in the theme parks does not have mobile order and you can end up waiting in a really long line for your coffee. Coffee acquired and now I'm going to take it to a coffee spot here. It's not quite as good as the one in Animal Kingdom. Is there any coffee spot as good as that one? But it's still a nice quiet place where you can enjoy your coffee and the view. Lead us there, Nitro Cold Brew right as you come in if you go straight if you don't turn to seuss landing or to marvel superhero island you actually come down on this beautiful landing that i find a lot of people are never in and there's all kinds of walkways and winding trails and there's benches and rocks to sit on but you get this really awesome view of pretty much the entire park you can watch the seuss High in the Sky Trolley train ride go by. You can look over at Mythos. You can see Velocicoaster and Hogwarts, parts of Toon Lagoon, and of course the Incredible Hulk right here. So it's a lovely spot to come relax with your coffee or other beverage. Uh, as you can see, you can also wind in down here and end up down on that landing. The far side of this is the smoking section. Just wanna let you know that as well. 
And while standing here drinking my coffee doesn't hold the same sentimental weight as my spot behind the tree of life, it is nice that there's places in theme parks that you can kind of tuck away from the crowds, take in the view and enjoy a cup of coffee. I actually think this is a pretty good cup of coffee. This is the nitro cold brew. I think it's better than a Starbucks nitro cold brew. And I like that it's not something you can get everywhere. I've also tried the sandwiches in there and they're pretty good. So Croissant Moon Bakery might not top my list as far as must do's throughout the park if I was just doing a one through 10. But as someone who needs their coffee, it's hard to beat a good cold brew that I've ever ordered. Ramping things up and getting really into the meat of things, it's time to head into Seuss Landing. I actually really like Seuss Landing and think it's pretty underrated. I think a lot of people tend to think Disney does theming way better than Universal, and in some cases that is true, but I don't think you can make that argument here in Seuss Landing. They do things like not have any straight angles. If you look at all the poles and the designs and everything, much like a Dr. Seuss book, nothing is straight. I've said it before and I'll say it again, but my favorite fun fact about this land is that even the trees aren't straight because they rescued trees from South Florida after a devastating hurricane. These trees were all wind damaged and they brought them here, rehabilitated them, and now there are these wonky trees throughout Seuss Landing. I think the attention to detail in this land is great. I also rather like the four attractions in this land. Well, most of them anyway. You've got the high in the sky Seuss Trolley train ride, which is kind of like the people mover of Seuss Landing and it takes you all around the land. You've got the Carasusel, which is a simple classic carousel, nothing wrong with that. You've also got One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, which is a Dumbo style spinner attraction, but it's actually a game where you're trying to avoid getting wet by the fish. Full transparency, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish was one of the contenders for my favorite choice in this land, but I still harbor resentment from the time I listened to the instructions and I still got wet. I hate getting wet, but I do think that's a good take on a spinner attraction. Now the last attraction in this land, you could say it's the headliner attraction, is the Cat in the Hat Dark Ride takes you through the cat in the hat story, but it actually spins you a decent amount. So heads up if you don't enjoy being spun. It's a fine dark ride. Some of the animatronics are questionable. And as much as I love Universal and think that a lot of things they do are great, this doesn't make the list. There's also several play areas, splash areas in Seuss Landing for little ones, lots of things for them to explore, which I think is important to point out in a theme park that has a lot of big thrills and height requirements. It's good to know where your kids can hang out too. Seuss Landing is also home to Circus McGurkis Cafe Stupendous, which is a quick service restaurant that, which I'm not gonna lie, surprised me the first time I ate there. I wrote it off as just a generic quick service restaurant. And on some level it is, they've got chicken tenders. They're kind of secret menu chicken tenders though, cheeseburgers, but they also have fried chicken and it was shockingly good. I'm not saying to eat there over somewhere like Wizarding World, but if you've got pickier eaters, it could be a good choice. Other things I love in this land, you can actually do meet and greets with a lot of the Dr. Seuss characters. So you'll see the Cat in the Hat, Sam I Am, Things 1 and 2, and the Grinch, the Lorax walking around. I love characters. I think these are really fun characters to interact with. But ultimately, there's only one choice for my top pick here in Seuss Landing. If you thought I picked green eggs and ham, well, you're right. Green Eggs and Ham is both the name of the restaurant as well as my favorite dish from the location. Named after the famed Dr. Seuss story, they sell all kinds of loaded tater tots. They've got buffalo chicken tots, pizza tots, vegan tots, carnitas tots. They even have hoo hash that comes in a little can. But my favorite of all are the green eggs and ham. I did not mean to rhyme that, but I guess Seuss Landing is wearing off on me. As you can see, they are delicious tater tots covered in white creamy queso, ham, and eggs with chives, which is what makes them green. These are one of, if not my favorite thing to eat in this theme park. The only thing that might top it is something from Harry Potter, but honestly, that's because I like being in Wizarding World and I enjoy eating those fish and chips because I feel like I'm in Harry Potter. These, on taste alone, may be the king. Mm, mm, mm. Universal has mastered the tater tot. They are crispy on the outside, but they're nice and meaty potato-y on the inside and all fluffy. The queso is amazing. The ham is a little bit salty. The eggs are nice and fluffy. These are amazing every time. In fact, these were a top contender when we did our eating only potatoes challenge here at Universal. You can watch that for more food recommendations. But truly, green eggs and ham slap. 
It's a pretty generous portion too, so you could definitely share it as a snack or it's been a meal of mine on many occasions. And as a bonus, I came down here to the front of Sue's Landing and I'm enjoying it on Sneech Beach. Mm. Mm. Truly, the only thing that could top green eggs and ham in this land is if I considered seasonal offerings like the Grinch Show or meeting the version of the Jim Carrey Grinch. That's the ultimate here in Sue's Landing, but for a 365 normal operation, Green Eggs and Ham, Chef's Kiss. Done in Seuss Landing, which brings us to the Lost Continent. But we're actually gonna skip the Lost Continent for now because my favorite thing here, spoiler alert, is also food. And I just ate a bunch of tots, plus I have a reservation in a little bit. So we'll be back. Pretend you're not seeing any of this. Pretend you don't see any of this. Skipping over Lost Continent for now means we are in my favorite land in the park, Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Now this is the Hogsmeade side of Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Diagon Alley is over at Universal Studios Florida, which is the original park. However, this is the original Wizarding World. This was the first one added. It took over part of Lost Continent. The Hogsmeade side is where you can visit the Three Broomsticks or the Hogshead Pub. You can drink delicious exclusive beers or butterbeer in all varieties. Probably most iconically, Hogsmeade is where you can find Hogwarts. This is where the glorious castle sits and inside of it, Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. It's the original home of Ollivander's wand shop where you can get chosen or purchase a wand and then do magic all over the land. There's also a lot of underrated entertainment here in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. You've got the Frog Choir, you've got the Triwizard Spirit Rally, and you've got the projection show at night where they project lights and story pieces onto Hogwarts Castle. I really love this show and it actually is a contender for my choice in this land. For most of the year it's just a classic show, however it's really fun at Halloween. So everything's a little spooky scary, they project the Mentors and the Dark Mark and Voldemort and Spiders. And then at Christmas they've got the Magic of Christmas at Hogwarts where they project scenes from things like the Yule Ball. And speaking of Halloween, one of my most favorite seasonal offerings anywhere takes place in this land only during Halloween. It's when the Death Eaters actually come take over Hogsmeade in the evenings. They have fog and smoke and the Death Eaters come out and you can actually duel them throughout the land. It's really, really cool and incredibly immersive. But we're going to nix seasonal items for this because obviously a year-round option is my favorite. And while there may be an obvious standout in this land, this is home of Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM, my favorite ride ever in the entire universe. There's also something to be said for the fact that Hogwarts is here. And even though it makes me nauseous, Forbidden Journey, the attraction itself, is incredibly cool and was very groundbreaking at the time. It interweaves practical sets with virtual sets. It puts you on this arm and brings you through so many different iconic Harry Potter moments. Chamber of Secrets, Quidditch, the Basilisk, the Forbidden Forest, the Mentors. It is quite an experience, even though it makes me really nauseous. There's something to be said for just being in this land in general, for getting a butterbeer or a wizard's brew and kind of tucking back in the alleyway behind Honeydukes and just feeling like you're in the wizarding world. There's something to be said for doing wand magic in this land. Hogsmeade is also home to Flight of the Hippogriff, which is kind of your kiddie coaster barnstormer of this park. It's a short ride where you do get to see Buckbeak the Hippogriff, so I recommend it for my diehard Harry Potter fans. You even got the train here is an iconic rite of passage in the stories. And of course the Three Broomsticks. I think best fish and chips I've ever had are in this land. So it's a harder choice than you might think. But ultimately, there's only one choice for me when it comes to my favorite. If you've been watching for a while, it's probably no surprise that I'm heading back to Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM. It's just my favorite attraction that's ever been. Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM is a roller coaster on the back of Sirius's motorbike where you are headed to a Care of Magical Creatures lesson with Hagrid. Arthur Weasley's enchanted that motorbike to duplicate it, but unfortunately, as you might predict, things don't go according to plan. You're gonna see so many magical creatures. You're gonna see Blast Ended Scroots, which is a book only reference, which I appreciate. You're gonna see Fluffy the Three-Headed Dog. You're gonna see the flying car. You're gonna see pixies and centaurs. You are gonna hear Thestrals. Hopefully you don't see them. And it is just the perfect attraction. 
part roller coaster, part dark ride, surprises along the way. It truly doesn't get better than this. Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM has a 48 inch height requirement. And because of that motorcycle style seat, it is a little bit different and unusual. So I absolutely recommend sitting in the test seat before you ride to make sure you're gonna be comfortable. There'd be nothing worse than waiting in a long line to find out that it's not gonna work out. Now it doesn't go upside down, but it is a thrill ride. So you are gonna have to put bags that are bigger than like a crossbody or a lanyard into a locker. And additionally, and maybe most important tip when riding this attraction is the fact that it does not take Universal Express Pass. The only way to ride Hagrid is by riding it in standby or occasionally single rider. But in my experience, single rider takes as long as, if not sometimes longer than the regular queue. And the regular queue has some cool details that you might want to stick around for. I went through some of them in my Secrets of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter video, so we can link that for you. My advice on the best times to ride this attraction are if you are staying on property as a Universal uh, Resort guest to come to the early park admission first thing in the morning. Hagrid's is usually on the docket when it's over here at Islands of Adventure. Get here as early as possible and while you'll still probably wait in the line, it will likely be shorter than it is the rest of the day. Otherwise, you can hang on till later in the day to ride it and hope that the line goes down. It doesn't normally, it's like two hours right now, but you can try jumping in line at the end of the night. One thing to keep in mind though as well is that this attraction does go down for technical difficulties pretty frequently and also it's just closed in the rain so you may not want to risk waiting to come last thing at night. For me, it just doesn't get better than that. It's just simply the best attraction I've ever been on. Yes, I think my love of Harry Potter certainly plays into that, but I also just think it's a really fun coaster. I have a big dumb smile on my face the whole time I'm riding it. I just love it. So. Not only is this my favorite in this land, it's my favorite in the entire park. I do think if I was gonna pick a runner up, it would be simply Hogwarts Castle. And I would kind of cheat and say that that includes the projection show and walking through the queue at Forbidden Journey. Those, both of those activities really encompass the magic of this land and the magic of this story to me. So I'm kind of cheating and saying that's my second choice. I'm gonna cheat even more and say that watching the show with either my favorite uh, exclusive wizarding beer or a butter beer would be the ideal situation. So basically I just combined three things into one. But uh, if you can tell, I'm obsessed with the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. They're my favorite theme park lands ever. And uh, it's hard to pick just one thing. From my favorite IP ever to one of my other favorite IPs ever, welcome to Jurassic Park. Probably unsurprising then that Jurassic Park is another land where it's really hard for me to choose. I know there's some big standouts like Velocicoaster, Jurassic Park River Adventure, but there's some really underrated things in this land as well, especially if you're a Jurassic Park fan. Jurassic Park is home to one of, if not the best character meet and greet of all time where you can meet blue and other full-grown raptors and i swear y'all you watch these other adults get scared and you're like okay dummies and then you get up there and it's terrifying it is such a cool experience jurassic park is also home to the discovery center which has real props and skeletons from the film jurassic park is home to the elusive pterodon flyers which you can only ride on if you've got a child it's the wanting what i can't have that makes that so appealing for the list jurassic park is also home to burger digs another of my favorite quick service restaurant and my favorite spot to get a burger in the park and speaking of food jurassic park is also home to the isla nublar ipa my all-time favorite craft beer made for a theme park if you know me, I love it when theme parks have exclusive beers you can't get anywhere else. This one's a nice floral IPA. It's absolutely delicious. So that's a top contender as well. And as I mentioned, Jurassic Park is home to two of the best attractions in the park. Jurassic Park River Adventure and Velocicoaster. Jurassic Park River Adventure is the OG attraction here. It's akin to a Splash Mountain where it's got your big drop. And I hate water rides, but I actually enjoy this one. It's going to take you through Jurassic Park, but on a boat unlike the film where you're in a Jeep. And of course, things are gonna go wrong. It's got some pretty cool animatronics, specifically the T-Rex at the end. And if you don't mind getting a little wet, it's a lot of fun. You know it's a strong endorsement for me if I'm willing to ride it, and I hate getting wet. But then you've also got the newest attraction in the park, Jurassic World Velocicoaster. This is that epic roller coaster set in the Jurassic World universe prior to the first film. It's got a 140 foot drop, a hanging inversion. It goes zero to 50 in two seconds. And then again, 40 to 70 in two seconds to get you up and over that top hat. Tons of inversions, that Mosasaurus barrel over the water. Plus, 
It has that amazing cue with the real live raptors in it. It's a tough choice here in Jurassic Park, but not that tough. Come on, you already know. There's a lot of great stuff in Jurassic Park, but nothing is as great as Velocicoaster. While I said that Hagrid's is my favorite roller coaster of all time, I think this is the best roller coaster I've ever been on. It is such an incredible story coaster. The way they weave together the theming of Jurassic World in with such a thrilling coaster, there's surprises around every corner. It's a nice long coaster, not to mention the best queue I've ever been in. Easy choice. Now, Velocicoaster, just like Hagrid's, does not offer Express Pass. If you'd like to ride this one, you're going to have to wait in standby or single rider. Their single rider land can go to capacity, and I don't actually recommend it because you skip out on the Raptors, which are one of the best things about this attraction. Velocicoaster does intend to get quite as long of a line, though, so you're able to usually hop on under an hour. It's 50 minutes right now, 5-0, whereas, again, remember Hagrid's was about two hours. This one also typically opens for that early theme park admission in the morning. So if you're staying here as a resort guest, I recommend prioritizing Hagrid's and then scooting over here to Velocicoaster. If you're a big Jurassic Park fan, you're definitely going to want to ride this one as well because it's got a ton of Easter eggs from the stories. You're going to see things like books written by Dr. Ian Malcolm, Dr. Alan Grant, and Dr. Ellie Sadler. Mr. DNA makes an appearance. It is just an overall incredible ride. Velocicoaster has a 51 inch height requirement. It does not have quite as unusual of a seat as Hagrid's does, but there's still a test seat outside if you'd like to check if it's gonna work for you. It also, <laughs> it also requires you to put your stuff in lockers. However, the lockers are midway through the queue. So you're able to take your stuff with you unless it's a really big bag. And with all that said, it's time for a Raptor run. That coaster is such a blast. I have so much fun every time I ride it. I notice new things when I ride it. It's just so much fun. If you're a coaster fan, make this one a priority. I mean, also make sure to meet Blue or another Raptor, explore the Discovery Center. And if you are okay with a water ride, Jurassic Park River Adventure is great too. And if you're a beer drinker, try that beer. There's a lot of good stuff in this land. One of my favorites, but you just can't top Velocicoaster. Oh my God, what if after all that, all that hype deciding between the great things in this land, I picked the rock climbing wall, like the one you can do at Dick's Sporting Goods Store. I do want to highlight Camp Jurassic as a whole though as well. Pterodon Flyers, the attraction is part of Camp Jurassic, but it also is a series of tunnels and slides and a really cool interactive playground, a great spot for your little ones to come while bigger kids and adults are riding the thrills here. Next up, a land with pretty much just one thing, so it's gonna win by default. I'm talking Skull Island Reign of Kong. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I didn't realize that this was its own land. I always thought it was part of Jurassic Park for a long time because there's just this one attraction here and it kind of fits with the Jurassic Park theme. But technically, Skull Island Reign of Kong is its own land and it's comprised of Skull Island Reign of Kong, a stand that has a hot dog. Oh my gosh, it's a foot long dog called the Kong Dog. Absolutely not. And a little merchandise card. So the winner is Skull Island Reign of Kong. Actually, I'm gonna get a little more specific and I'm gonna say the winner is the giant animatronic of King Kong on the attraction. Skull Island Reign of Kong is a bus style attraction, same ride vehicle as Fast and the Furious Supercharged over at the other park. And it takes you back to the island where King Kong was found. So the prequel movies, the Jack Black ones, not the OG uh, black and white films, where they are on the island and discover King Kong amongst other scary, spooky creatures such as dinosaurs. Hence why I thought this was part of Jurassic Park. The attraction is fine for the most part. It's got a 36 inch height requirement, so it is lower than a lot of other thrills in this park. And it's got some great big set pieces like you can see here. The big gates that you're gonna physically drive through, the King Kong rock structure right here in the queue. In fact, the queue is kind of a nightmare, just a heads up. It's the scariest queue I've ever been in. And that includes Halloween Horror Nights houses. Okay, that's probably dramatic, but you're not expecting it to be scary. And it is. Anyway, Skull Island Reign of Kong then employs a simulator technology where you've got screens all around you and you're driving through on this adventure. Come face to face with dinosaurs, come face to face with Kong. However, the real star of the show and the reason I recommend people ride this attraction is it finishes with a gigantic King Kong animatronic. And when I say big, I mean 30 feet tall, 18 feet wide big. 
It is a very impressive animatronic. And if this attraction doesn't have a long line or you've got Express Pass, I highly recommend riding this attraction just to see that. Is it as good as Confrontation, the original King Kong ride at Universal Studios Florida? No, I don't think it is. There's no banana breath, there's no cable cars, but that King Kong animatronic is pretty cool. And I think at this point, this attraction's a little bit underrated. So in a land again with not much else, it's time to go see King Kong. If there's one land that I have no idea what to pick as my favorite, it's this one. Welcome friends to Toon Lagoon. Toon Lagoon is home to the wettest water rides possibly of all time. Dudley Do-Right's Ripsaw Falls and Popeye and Budo's Build Dredge Barges. I mean, just look at these people. They are sopping wet. Dudley Do-Right's Ripsaw Falls is a Splash Mountain style drop coaster, of course, featuring the fan favorite franchise, Dudley Do-Right. And Popeye and Bluto Build Ratch Barges is a round raft style attraction akin to Cali River Rapids at Animal Kingdom. If I were to choose between the two, I think I like Popeye's a little bit more, if for no other reason than the sitting is less awkward. On Dudley's, you have to like straddle the person in front of you while getting wet. Pretty awkward when it's a stranger. So. I picked Popeyes solely because it's just a seat in a round raft. But honestly, neither are worth how wet you get. And when I say you get wet, I'm not talking a little wet like Splash Mountain. I'm not talking even possibly wet like Cali River Rapids. I am talking, it looks like you jumped into a lagoon like a tune and then went into the shower and then went swimming in the ocean and then got off the ride. You are soaking wet riding these attractions. The rest of Toon Lagoon is just shopping and dining for the most part, featuring characters every kid knows and loves, such as Kathy, Marmaduke, and this general guy right here. I don't think Toon Lagoon is bad by any means. I think the theming is pretty well done and executed across the land. There's a lot of fun photo ops and it's pretty colorful and fun in here. I just think it needs an upgrade and probably a new IP attached to it because I don't think anybody knows who these cartoon characters are at this point. And I think it could be a really fun land if they rethemed it to some of other Universal really beloved characters and properties. Am I just stalling trying to think of a thing to pick? Maybe. I'm just kidding. We're going to Wimpy's for a treat that very few people know you can get here at Universal. Dole Whip. Yeah, that Dole Whip. Did you know you can get classic Dole Whip pineapple, the most iconic treat at Walt Disney World, right here in Universal? Now, you can only get pineapple, or I've only ever seen pineapple at Universal. They sell it here at Islands of Adventure at Wimpy's. They also sell it at the ice cream shop uh, across from the Bourne Stuntacular over in Universal Studios, Florida. But, it, but it's Dole branded pineapple Dole Whip that you know and love. Now, pineapple's not my favorite flavor, but just taking that bite, there is a delightful novelty to it. If you're not familiar with Dole Whip, it's basically just fruit sorbet, and it is legendary, particularly at Walt Disney World, because you used to only be able to get it at Disney World, Disneyland, and the Dole Plantation um, in Hawaii. Now you can get it lots of different places. You can order it and make it at home if you get the mix, and clearly it's here at Universal, too. But it's kind of a secret thing here. Not many people know it's around, and uh, I think that's pretty neat. You could even take this one step further and bring your Dole Whip over to my favorite spot to luxuriate here in this land. Down by the water, you get a great view of Velocicoaster. You get a great view of people getting soaking wet on Popeyes. You're eating the Dole Whip. I don't think it gets much better. Seriously, I don't have anything against Kathy, Betty Boop, Popeye, any of these characters. In fact, you can meet them sometimes, which is kind of fun. I just think that Universal owns and has the rights to so many fun IPs that they could redo this. I guess you could make the argument that with so many water rides, Universal really should have a water themed attraction in this area. They could easily convert it to. I just wish Universal had a really good water themed IP. Welcome to Marvel Superhero Island. This is our next land, and it's home to a lot of favorite attractions and favorite characters. 
Now, before we get into it, though, I have to remind you that Marvel here at Universal is themed to comic book Marvel, whereas Marvel at Disney, like Avengers Campus and Disney California Adventure, is themed to MCU movie Marvel. It gets a little dicey and confusing. In fact, there is an agreement between Disney and Universal. When Disney purchased Marvel, they had to figure out how theme park rights were going to work. And the agreement that Disney and Universal came to is that no Marvel characters that appear here in Marvel Superhero Island can appear in a Disney park east of the Mississippi, aka Walt Disney World. That's why you'll never have Spider-Man doing a meet and greet in the Magic Kingdom. You aren't going to have Incredible Hulk in Hollywood Studios but you can have Guardians of the Galaxy because there's no presence of those characters here in Marvel Superhero Island. And that's also why you can have Avengers Campus out in California. There's a lot of great stuff to choose from in this land as well. You've got the Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man, which is a 3D simulator attraction that takes you on an adventure with Spider-Man. That's a lot of people's favorite attraction, favorite superhero. It's a great attraction. It just makes me a little nauseous. You've got Doctor Doom Fearfall, which is kind of like Tower of Terror in the sense that it's a drop attraction, but it's not a top for me. It's not one I would wait a long time for. You've got Storm Force Acceleration, which is basically the teacups. This is also where you can meet some of your favorite superheroes. So, so if you do have kids or as an adult, you do want to meet Spider-Man or Captain America or the X-Men, you can do it here in Marvel Superhero Island. Another thing I love in this land are the shops. There are some really cool pieces of merchandise and collectibles that you can get here in this land. But for me, there's only one choice for the best thing and most favoritest thing in the land. And that's the Incredible Hulk Coaster. Oh my gosh. It was like beautifully timed that. The Incredible Hulk Coaster has a 51 inch height requirement seven inversions, max speed of 67 miles an hour, and it shoots you out of that launch tunnel literally with the power of multiple jumbo jet engines. It is such a fun coaster. Now it's not quite as smooth as Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure, TM, or Velocicoaster, but it is like the OG thrill of this park. It's got a really great soundtrack written and recorded by Patrick Stump of Fall Out Boy, there are some fun Easter eggs in the queue if you are a Hulk or a Marvel fan, and it's overall a really good time. Unlike Hagrid's and Velocicoaster, however, Incredible Hulk Coaster is part of Universal Express Pass. So if you bought Universal Express or you're staying at one of the resorts that provides it to you, this is a very good use of one because as you can imagine, it's very, very popular. There is a single rider line here that I've had some success using. It tends to move a little bit quicker than the one at Hagrid's or Velocicoaster. And honestly, if you're a coaster fan, this is a great attraction. Definitely a must do for me and a favorite every time I ride. it. If you don't have Express Pass, this is a good one to rope drop as it's not usually part of that early park admission. Therefore, anybody can rope drop it at the same time, and it tends to have a shorter wait than Hagrid's or Velocicoaster first thing in the day. It also tends to go down pretty dramatically in the evening time, and it's really fun at night. And if you didn't already know, you probably guessed by the description that this is another one you have to put your items in a locker. You're actually gonna go through metal detectors here like Velocicoaster, that way nothing falls out of your pockets and hurts anybody or gets stuck on the track, so see you in a little bit. Incredible Hulk Coaster, always a blast, always a good time. Pretty intense. I've literally lost an earring on it before. Uh, but now it's time to go back to the Lost Continent. Made it back to the Lost Continent, which is our final land here at Universal's Islands of Adventure. Lost Continent was a lot bigger and bolder when this park opened. It had a few different attractions that were rethemed or taken down for Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Flight of the Hippogriff was rethemed, as well as Dueling Dragons, which when Wizarding World first opened had been rethemed to the uh, Triwizard Tournament, where you were choosing one of the dragons to ride on. It was a really fun coaster, but eventually it was taken down for Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM. Remaining in Lost Continent, you've got Poseidon's Fury, which is a walkthrough show style attraction. I actually think it's pretty fun. There's some really cool effects, like a water tunnel that you walk through. It's definitely a little bit cheesy and a little dated at the end, but it's a good time killer if you've got 30 minutes to spare. There's also some eating to be done here in Lost Continent. There's Fire Eater's Grill that does kebabs. There's also the Talking Fountain, which is really fun. And sometimes they also have a haunted uh, Halloween store all year long. But 
You may have guessed that there was only one thing here that I could choose as my favorite. In fact, it's the world's best theme park restaurant according to that sign that's been here for 10 years. Mythos. Mythos Restaurant is a true sit-down restaurant. There aren't a ton of those in Universal the way there are in Disney parks. There's a lot of like hybrid quick service table service where you order at a counter and they bring it to you. There's a lot of true quick service restaurants. But Mythos is a true server come to your table sit-down restaurant. It's, as you could guess, inspired by Greek mythology, so the venue steers a little bit Greek and Mediterranean. I think this restaurant is absolutely stunning. It feels like you are in Poseidon's cave under the sea, and you're gonna see lots of elements of that between the different light fixtures, the sculptures, the artwork, the wrought iron work, and then, if you're lucky like me today, I've never actually gotten to sit down here, you could just sit down on the lagoon side and enjoy a beautiful view of the park. Taking a look at the menu for Mythos, again, you're gonna have that Greek Mediterranean flavor profile woven into the items, but I think it's a good mix of the familiar as well as the kind of unexpected for a theme park. You've got things like grilled lamb meatballs, calamari, hummus on the appetizer menu, as well as one of my favorite things, I think it might be the thing we have to get today. You've got soups and salads featuring the chef's signature Greek salad, one of the best Greek salads I've ever had, thanks to that herb lemon vinaigrette. And then as far as your entrees go, you've got a little bit of everything. You've got a roasted chicken, you've got steak, you've got seafood, a couscous bowl, uh, a sea scallop risotto, catch of the day. A lot of people love the pork chop as well. That's one of their most popular items. You've also got some sandwiches, a lamb burger, one of their signatures. And they're also known for their fork, knife, and spoon grilled cheese, which is a grilled cheese in tomato soup topped with pork belly and garnished with chips. You literally eat it with a knife and fork. They've got a variety of signature beverages as well, including some non-alcoholic and alcoholic cocktails. I've had the pleasure of enjoying quite a few dishes from Mythos. That Greek salad I mentioned was great. The bowl is delicious. But if there's one thing I ate here that surprised me with how amazing it was, it's this right here. This is the Spanakopita deck. And it's a really fun twist on Spanakopita, which traditionally is like a fried spinach and cheese stuffed pastry and phyllo dough. But instead here, you're doing it in a dip form. So you've got spinach, feta, lemon, fresh herbs. It's served with these house-made pita chips that have been seasoned with sitar spice. And then on top, you've got this relish made of cucumber, tomato, and olives. Yum! Look at this. Oh my gosh, so cheesy, so cheesy, so cheesy. my gosh, it's just as good as I remember it. So glad I didn't get a salad right now. Don't get me wrong, the salad is great. And if you want something lighter and fresh, it's a great choice. But to me, this is a little bit more unique. The pita chips that start there are incredible. They are way different than buying like Stacy's pita chips in a bag. They taste like fresh pita because they are, and they're just lightly fried. So they're really garlicky and have some great seasoning on them. Inside the spinach chip, it is creamy, it is cheesy. You've got that kind of tanginess from the feta and then you've got the cool freshness from that cucumber tomato relish on top really really good creamy spinach dip and the reason i like mythos is because it's a really consistent theme park restaurant is it the best theme park restaurant i've ever been to no i don't think it is is it the best sit down restaurant in universal inside a park I would argue that's true. What I like about Mythos, a few things. One, I think the menu is great. I personally love Mediterranean and Greek food, and I love that we have that in a theme park setting. I think the menu is just different enough that you do have unusual things like lamb meatballs or a lamb burger, but then you've also got classics like a burger and twists on classics like that knife, fork, and spoon grilled cheese. I think Mythos is also a pretty good price point when you're talking a full sit-down restaurant inside a theme park. We all know theme park dining is expensive, but I do think you get pretty good bang for your buck when you come to Mythos. Now, not everybody wants to do a sit-down restaurant during their theme park day. Not everybody wants to spend the time or the money to sit and have a full meal. But if you do, Mythos is a great choice, and I've consistently had great service and great food when I come here. Plus, look at this view as the sun's going down. Absolutely stunning. One thing I will say about Mythos is, as you can guess, it's pretty popular, so I highly recommend booking a reservation on Universal's website. There are days where they take walk-ups, but sometimes, like tonight, they only were taking reservations and sending any walk-ups over to Confisco Grill. So if you want to dine at Mythos, I'd go ahead and book that reservation. They're relatively easy to get, however, I was able to book one today, this morning, before I came to the park. Uh, so keep checking back if you don't see one, and hopefully one will pop up.
wrapped up my meal and came out behind Mythos. What an absolutely gorgeous view to end my evening in Islands of Adventure. The more I explore the park, the more I find these incredible little oasises of quiet and magic and happiness. Look, fireworks from the uh, projection show on Hogwarts. There are a lot of little hidden gem places to luxuriate and relax in this park. So when it seems really, really busy and you're overwhelmed by the crowds of Wizarding World of Harry Potter, grab yourself a Dole Whip or an ice cream or a pretzel or a beer or something and uh, find these little tucked away patios because there's a lot to love about this park. Well, friends, that is a wrap on Molly's favorite things here at Universal's Islands of Adventure. What are your favorite things in this park? Definitely let me know. I hope you had fun following along. I feel like this park's choices were a good mix of like big e-ticket must-do attractions and then maybe a few underrated or unknown things and places. So let me know what you love to do here. Let me know what park I should do favorite things in next. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly and it's been magical. Now go watch the best secrets of Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Toodles. Toodles. I've literally never said toodles in my entire life. Oh no.